Um, it's a huge pleasure to welcome back to UCD uh, Kevin Barry. I'm delighted that Kevin is joining us uh, at a particularly busy time for him um, for all sorts of good reasons. Um, some of you might have heard the interview on Arena Radio just last night uh, where he uh, and his partner Olivia Smith are celebrating the publication of the third year of mm. winter, um, winter um, papers which is the Christmas annual for book lovers. So do uh, keep that in mind for Christmas shopping. So we'll have a chance to talk to Kevin in uh, more detail later. But without any further ado, could you express your welcome? And he will read. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Margaret. It's great to be back to read here again. Um, it's a very early, delicate hour of the morning to be reading this filt out in public. Um, I'll see what I can do. I'll see how we get on with it. I'm going to read from the story called Fjord of Killery, which is a story about a poet tiring of city life in Dublin and buying an old hotel out, out, in, out on the coast of, of County Galway out there. Um, when the, the story actually appeared and it came out, I met a real life Irish poet on the street in Galway, the late uh, Dennis O'Donoghue, and he said, um, oh, I read that, that, that story about the Irish poet. And I said, oh, right, yeah. He said, very good, very good. Um, I enjoyed that. That was funny. And um, I confessed to Dennis that I had one doubt about the story. I said, Jesus, Dennis, would a poet really have the wherewithal to buy a hotel? And he said, don't underestimate us, <laughs> which was nice. Um, I apologize, as always, in advance for the ferocious, foul language. This is just me reporting this stuff. It's, I'm only the messenger. Um, so this is, I'm going to read the first few pages, and then we'll skip the middle bit, and we'll get to the end, and I'll get the end of the story in as well. So Fjord of Killery. So I bought an old hotel out on the Fjord of Killery. It was set hard by the harbour wall, with whale ray mounting across the water and disgracefully grey skies overhead. It rained 287 days of the year, and the locals were given to magnificent mood swings. The night in question, the rain was particularly violent. It came down like handfuls of nails flung hard and fast by a seriously riled sky god. I was at this point eight months in the place and about convinced it would be the death of me. It's end of the fucking world stuff out there, I said. The chorus of locals in the hotel's lounge bar as always ignored me. I was a fretful blow-in by their mark, and simply not cut out for tough, gnarly, west of Ireland living. They were listening instead to John Murphy, our alcoholic funeral director. I'll bury Anton that fucking moves, he said. Bastard suicides tinkers, he said. I couldn't give a fucking monkeys, he said. Whale Ray is the most depressing mountain you've ever seen, by the way, and its gaunt, looming shape filled almost every view from the Water's Edge Hotel, the lounge bars included. The locals drank mostly Bushmills whiskey and Guinness Stout, and they drank them to great excess. I wiped their slops from the counter with a bar clot I had come to hate, with a passion that verged on the insane. I said, but seriously, that's one motherfucker of a high tide, no? Barely the toss of a glance I received. The bar talk had shifted to roads, mileage, and general directions. They made a geography of our country by the naming of pubs. Do you know Madigan's in Minute? I do, of course. You take a left there, I have you now. The hotel had 23 bedrooms and listed westward. You could set a can of peas on the floor of just about any bedroom and it would roll slowly in the direction of the gibbering Atlantic. The estate agent had gussied up the history of the place in the brochure. Traditional coaching in, original beams, visited by Thackeray, heritage bleeding out the wazoo, etc. And I had leapt at it. I was the last of the hopeless romantics. The bar talk moved on briefly from roads and directions. If he's still around when her bandages come off, Bill not, the surveyor said, he's a braver man than me. Nice woman, John Murphy agreed, as long as you don't put your hand in the cage. 
behind the bar. The Guinness tap, the Smithwick's tap, the lager taps, the line of optics, the neatly stacked rows of glasses and a high stool that sat by a wee slit window with a view across the water towards Whale Ray. The iodine tang of kelp hung in the air always and put me in mind of embalming fluid. Bill Knott looked vaguely from his bushmills towards the water. Hi, you shall right, he said, but what would we be talking about for Bell Mullet, would you say, off a slow road? The primary interest of these people's lives, it seemed to me, was how far one place was from another and how long it might take to complete the journey given the state of the roads. Bill had been in haulage as a young man and considered himself expert. I don't know, Bill, I said. Would we say an hour and twenty if you wasn't tail back down to Newport? I said, I really don't fucking well know, Bill. There are those who'd say you'll do it in the hour. He sipped delicately. But you'd want to be grease fucking lightning coming up out of Westport, wouldn't you? We could be swimming it yet, Bill, I said. Now I had made, despite it all, a mild success of myself in life. But on turning 40 the previous year, I had sensed exhaustion rising up in me like rot. I found that to be alone with the work all day was increasingly difficult and the city had become a jag on my nerves. There was too much young flesh around. The brochure about the hotel appeared in my life like a revelation. I clutched it in my hands for days on end. I grew feverish with the notion of a westward flight. I lay in bed with the brochure as the throb of the city sounded a kind of raspy, taunting note, and I moaned as I read aloud, original beams, traditional coaching in. Thackeray, established 1648. Yes, the hotel had the promise of an ideal solution. I could distract myself from myself with its day-to-day -day running, its endless little errands, and perhaps late at night or very early in the morning, I would continue at some less intense level with the poetry. All my friends, every last one of them said, The Shining. But I was thinking the west of Ireland, the murmurous ocean, the rocky hills, hard founded in a greenish light, the cleansing air, the stoats peeping shyly from little gaps in the dry stone walls. Yes, it would all do to make a new man of me. Of course, I hadn't counted on having to listen to my summer staff, a pack of energetic young Belarusians fucking each other at all angles of the clock. And the ocean turned out to gibber rather than murmur. Gibber, gibber, whoosh, gibber, gibber. Push down the far end of the bar, Mick Harty, distributor of bull semen for the vicinity, was molesting his enormously fat wife, Vivian. Well, after a meal at the place run by the Dutch faggots, he said, we had oysters for a starter, they had me gone fucking bananas. Vivian slapped and roared at him as he stroked her massive haunches. She reddened and chortled as he twisted her around and pulled her vast rear side towards his crotch area. Nobody apart from me paid a blind bit of attention to the spectacle. And even as she suffered a pretend butt rape from her cackling husband, she turned to me and informed me precisely what they'd paid for the meal at the Dutch couple's restaurant. We had two starters, two mains, we shared a dessert, two bottles of wine, two cappuccinos, she said, as Mick grinded slowly behind her, hoarsely yodeling an Alicia Keys love ballad. 136 euros even. Not cheap, Quivine. Cappuccino's a breakfast drink, I said. You're not supposed to drink it after a meal. I was not well liked out in the fjord of Killery. I was considered superior. Of course, I was fucking superior. I ate at least five portions of fruit and veg daily. I had a meagre tree from oily fish coming out my ears. I limited myself strictly to 21 units of alcohol a week. I hadn't written two consecutive lines of a fucking poem in eight months flat. I was versed instead in the strange, illicit practices of the hill country. The fuckers are washing diesel up there again, John Murphy said to Howrigans. Of course, they the father of diesel washer before them, didn't they? Cunts to a man. Cunts. Bill not confirmed. Outside, the rain continued to hammer at our dismal little world, and the sky had shocked the last of its evening grey to take on an intense purplish tone that was ominous, close in, biblical. Sky is weirding up like I don't know fucking what, I said. Now, at this point, I'm going to skip forward a few pages, and it's amazing how little you're going to miss. Um, <laughs> All that happens is the rain continues to hammer down on the Fjord of Killery, the waters continue to rise, and our locals and the, 
the residents of the bar start to figure out that we could be in a bit of trouble here. It looks like the place is going to flood. Eventually, our, our barman, Quivine, um, moves everyone to upstairs. I moved everybody upstairs. There was a function room that I used for the occasional wedding. It had a fully stocked bar and operational disco lights. We weren't a moment too soon. As I trailed up the stairs, keeping to the rear of all my locals and Belarusians, I cast an eye back over my shoulder. It had the look of death's dateless night out there. Hop, people, I cried. Hop now, for Jesus' sake. More calls were made on mobiles. We were promised that the emergency services were being moved out. I turned off the harsh strip lighting overhead and switched to the mood lighting, which moved in lovely, dreamy disco swirls. Even yet, the rain hammered down on my old hotel at Killery. I opened the bar and the locals weren't shy about stepping up to it. We drank, we whispered, we laughed like cats. Bill Knott reckoned the distance to Clare Island overseas, if it should come to it. Of course, it would not be the first time, he said, that the likes of us were sent hopping for the little boats. Vivian Harty whispered to Janie McAllister. Janie's colour was returning with frequent nips of my brandy. Vivian swirled it in the glass and fed it to the old lady. Her tiny grey head she cradled on a vast lap. Thackeray, on visiting the backwoods of Ireland, bemoaned the choking peat smoke and the obstreperous cider and the diet of raw ducks and raw peas and also a particular inn. No pen can describe that establishment, he wrote, as no English imagination could have conceived it. John Murphy told us loudly that he loved his wife. She still excites me, he said. It's been 28 years and I still get a horn on me when I see that bitch climb a stairs. <laughs> I went to the landing outside the function room. I looked down the road. It was a waterway. The hotel porch had disappeared and dozens of cormorants were approaching in formation across the water. It was like the attack on Dresden. I rushed back to the function room just as the cormorants landed on the kitchen roof out back and a weeping Mick Harty was confessing to Vivian Harty an affair of 15 years standing with her sister. All the old filth starts to come out, Alan Fettel said. Vivian approached her husband and embraced him and planted a light kiss on his neck as they held each other against the darkness. Then she bit him on the neck. Blood came in great angry spurts. I vomited briefly and I decided to put on some music. I looked out the landing window as I dashed along the corridor to get CDs from my room. This was a very bad move. Seven sheep in a rowing boat were being bobbed about on the waters of Killery. The sheep appeared strangely calm. I picked lots of old familiars. Abba, the pretenders, Brian Adams. I pelted back to the function room. We're here, I cried. We might as well have a disco. Oh, and we danced the night away out in the fjord of Killery. We danced to Chikatita slowly and sensuously. We danced in great wet-eyed nostalgia to Brass and Pocket, and we had all the old steps still, as if 1979 was only yesterday. We punched the air madly to summer of 69. I went out to the landing to find the six Belarusians sitting on the top step of the stairs. The waters of Killery were halfway up the stairs. Footstools sailed by in the lobby below, toilet rolls, placemats, phone books, but what could I do? I returned to the function room and I served out pints hand over fist. All mobile signals were down. There appeared on the horizon no saviours in high-vis clothing. The waters were rising yet. And the view suddenly was clear to me. The world opened out to its grim beyonds and I realised that at 40, one must learn the rigours of acceptance. Capitalise it, acceptance. I needed to accept what was put before me, be it a watery grave in Ireland's only natural fjord, or a return to the city in its greyer intensities, or a wordless exile in some steaming Cambodian swamp hole. Our poems are no poems, our children are not, lovers are not, illness or otherwise success or its absence. I would accept all that was put in my way from here on through until I breathed my last. Bill Knott danced. 
John Murphy dance. The McAllisters and the Fettles waltzed. The Belarusians dry humped one another in the function room's darker corners. The Harties were in deep emotional conversation in a booth. Mick held to his bleeding neck a wad of napkins. I myself took to the dance floor, swiveling slowly on my feet, and closed my eyes against the swirling lights. The pink backs of my eyelids became twin screens for flashing apparitions of all my childhood pets. Are you enjoying yourselves, lads? What would we be talking about for Loch Ray, would you say? Shouldn't sure, they come back from that place in one lung half the size of the other? Oh, that's England for you. I ran out to the landing for a spot check on the flood and I was met there by Alexei, the wall-eyed Belarusian. He indicated, with a happy jerk of his thumb, the water level on the stairs. It had dropped a couple of steps. I patted his back and winked just once and returned to the disco. 1648 was a year shy of Cromwell's landing in Ireland and already the inn at Killery Fjord was in business. They would see out this disaster too. Now random phrases and images came at me, the sudden quick-fire assaults that signal a new idea, and I knew that they would come in sequence soon enough. Their predestined rhythms would assert. I felt a new, quiet ecstasy take hold. The gloom of youth had at last lifted. Thanks very much. Cheers. <laughs> Well, I think it's safe to say we're fully awake. <laughs> um, thanks to everyone for, oh, and apologies. Will I kill this microphone? Okay. Uh, thanks to everyone for sending in such great questions. And for fear I don't credit you uh, in its sufficient time, maybe, maybe I'll share the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to say particular thanks to Chloe Byrne, Adele Drevno, Daniela Manning, Evelyn McCann, Pierce McCaughey, Samantha Haywood, Kayleen, uh, Kay, uh, Colleen Fitzpatrick, Ali Elliott, and Fander Mark Machado. I'm going to kick off straight away with um, a question from Adele, uh, who noted the Shining reference in oh, Forge right. of Killery. <laughs> and her question to you, Kevin, is, do you have any work and no play Jack Torrance moments or experiences when you moved into the old barracks in County Sligo? And I suppose, in a way, Adele's question, I think, speaks for all of us, which is the question, where do you get this material, be it, yeah. you know, Gridlock and Maynooth or wow. Apocalypse well, uh, and Whale Ray? Well, with Fjord of Killery, actually, it came very directly. I was out on, on my bike. I go cycling in, in kind of the early summer, or what passes for it, up around our place. We live in County Sligo, and I go out to Mayo and around Killery Fjord and stuff a bit. And I was in, I was in a, a small hotel lounge bar um, one night on a bank holiday Monday night, and it was just pissing down outside. And um, the locals were lined up at the bar, and they were talking about roads, mileage, and general <laughs> directions. That's all they talked about. How, how long now to get to, to Kildare Town if you're going down by the dock? It was just bizarre. And I actually took out the notebook, <laughs> and I was just putting this stuff down. And sometimes you get a kind of a gift as a story writer. You get a story in a single fell swoop. I looked out the window, and I thought, Geez, that water's coming high. I thought, what if it kept rising? What if the water just kept on coming? And I thought, oh great, what I have here so is an apocalypse story. It's the end of the world. But the twist is, is that this is the end of the world as it would be perceived from a small hotel lounge bar in the west of Ireland. How would they react? And all they do really is they start drinking quicker. That's, 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 that's all that happens. But it's funny, I, I, I was reading the story about two years after I wrote it. Um, I think in an event in Kilkenny or something. And as I was reading down through it, I realized, you know, it's a very kind of loud, antic story on the surface with lots going on, apocalyptic floods and nature out of whack and all that sort of stuff. But I realized that this is a really quiet story underneath. What it's really about is just, it's a story about aging. It's about getting older. So the key paragraph is when he talks about acceptance towards the end, it's just about, about moving to a new phase in life. And then I dated the story. I went, Jesus, when did I write it? And it turns out I wrote it about a week before I turned 40 myself. So it was obviously on my mind in a none too subconscious way. So that's what the story was ultimately about. But I do have lots of those uh, Jack Torrance days in my shed in County Sligo. I mean, I'm very disciplined now as a writer. I go out and I, I, I sit in the shed for four hours a day, six or seven days a week. Um, but of those six or seven days a week, it only seems to be going well maybe one or two days, you know? Most of the time it's really slow and sludgy and you're kind of drooling and staring out at the fucking endless Sligo rain 
and nothing much seems to be happening, you know, but you realise about once, just often enough, you get a day where suddenly there's 500 words down or there's 1,000 words down and the, the hand seems guided across the page. But you realise those aren't really the writing days. The writing days are where you're sitting there just ugh, feeling like your brain is made out of porridge that's been left in the pot for too long. And you, that's when you're actually there, you're waiting. Because fiction occurs not in the front of your brain, it happens in your subconscious places, in the back of your mind. And it's just a case of waiting for the material to present itself. And you're part of the deal as the writer. And this is kind of esoteric sounding, but when you say, I'm going to write, which is a declaration of enormous ego, I have something to say to the world. When you say that, what you're doing is you're making a pact with your own subconscious, you're saying, give me stuff, give me material, give me stories, and my part of the deal is I have to sit in the shed and wait, and some days it will go, okay, we'll give him something, he's there for four hours and we'll give you a few lines. So that's how it seems to work. <laughs> I mean, in terms of the course, I think one of the things we've been finding is that so often creative writers are, are the best commentators themselves on writing, and we've looked a couple of times in the course on uh, some quotations from Raymond Carver, I suppose, in particular, and Chloe Byrne's question, I think, follows on really well, Kevin, there, and, and Chloe's questions really are to do with writing process, so she asks, when writing, do you focus more on storyline um, or elements like humour? And for you, does style outweigh plot or vice versa? And when you look at commonplace objects with Raymond Carver in mind, do you think plot plays an equal role or is it just a stem for creativity? Yeah. Um, I, 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 I write in quite a high style, I suppose. I, 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 I like to, to kind of lay it on heavily enough with, with, with the prose. Um, I, I don't disregard plot by any means, but I like there to be just enough plot to keep the reader thumbing through the pages. I don't like to have stories that are overloaded with, with plot mechanics and stuff having to happen and going off. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I tend to think that most writers, or a lot of writers, are either kind of failed musicians or terrible singers. Um, it's a kind of a displacement activity for making music. And I think with short stories in particular, every short story has its own kind of inherent melody our tune. It's like a musical form and you just kind of try and listen it out line by line and you let one line give on to the next line and it's the kind of the sound of the story that will dictate its, its, its content or its meaning. I, I remember years ago when I was kind of trying to write myself properly, seriously in, in, in my 20s in Cork City I was living in then, um, coming across an interview with the great American novelist Don DeLillo and he said something that really struck me as uh, forcefully he said, I'm totally prepared to change the meaning of a sentence for the sake of its sound. All I'm really interested in is, is the sound and the rhythm on the page. And I thought, God, that's absolutely true to the way I feel about it as well, mm. you know? Um, I, I, and it, it, it struck me as well that I read my stories, or I write the stories almost for them to be heard mm. as much as read on the page, you know? Um, people like to hear the stuff. So it's, 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 um, it's, it's, it's no surprise, I guess, that over the last few years, when I'm in my shed now, I'm often writing for, um, for actors increasingly, we're writing play scripts and, and film scripts mm. as well. Mm. And I think that maybe brings us to a couple of specific stories. Um, a number of people had questions about Dark Lies the Island. Mm. Um, Evelyn McCann asked, what made you choose it as the title story? Uh, I think a number of people have asked questions, particularly about the very troubling, um, mm. I suppose, characterization of the central character in that story. Um, and a related question from Samantha Haywood, out of the short stories, which is the most unappreciated and why? Okay. So throw you two if you don't yeah, um, Dark Lies the Island, the story, it was, it was, it's, I'd say it's one of the most um, troublesome ones I've had on my desk as a, as a technical writing problem, and every story is its own problem that it presents. Um, it's unusual amongst my stories because there's almost not a funny line in it. You know, usually I write comedy or dark comedy, whereas this is a very, it's a very sad story tiptoeing towards possible tragedy, um, and I found it very difficult. And my problem for a long time with it was the ending of the story was very different than it is now. I, I allow a chink of light in at the end mm. in the story as it's ended. For a long time, it there was no light at the end and she, the girl proceeded to, to take her own life. And I kind of, and it was kind of a very powerful last page, but I kind of couldn't go with it. I was very unsettled by it. Um, I wrote a story a good few years ago now about, must be about seven years ago. I remember I was in Toronto for a winter and I was really troubled by it, by the ending where she had taken her own life. I thought, I, 
I can't go with it. And I kind of pulled back from it at the last moment and allowed a piece of light in it where she gets some sort of temporary relief from her, from her mental turmoil that she's in. Something like sleep, isn't and it? And she gets something like sleep mm. at the end. But it, it was, I, I, I'm very fond of the story and I'm, very, I, I, I'm still moved by, by her when I read it. But it's, um, I'm not convinced I have the right end, ending on it. Mm. Maybe the harsher ending was the truer ending for that story. I don't know, but I, I just couldn't go with it. I had to leave some piece of light mm. at the ending. And have you been surprised by feedback from readers on that story? Yeah, I, yeah. I, was, I was up doing something similar in NUIG, actually, um, not so long ago. And it was the story that I got most questions about and, and most... Um, yeah. Most uh, in terms of, of neglected masterpieces yes. in, in my book, <laughs> I, there is a story um, called Wistful England in which kind of nothing happens. Um, just a guy living in the East End of, of, of um, London thinking about a, a lost love back in Ireland. And it's kind of a very uneventful story, I guess. But I th it is one of my favourites and, and people don't seem to mention it Just very much. I don't know what's wrong with you that you don't pick <laughs> up on it. Mea culpa. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kevin was telling me on the way here that um, Dark Lies the Island um, is uh, about to be made into a film. So that would be really interesting to hear in a bit of detail really about that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the idea, the genesis and how it's going. Yeah, it started out as um, quite a direct adaptation of some of the stories that they were going to be different stories taken and running into each other over the course of a single day in a small Irish town. But in the end, it became a kind of a new story, really, just using some of the characters from various stories in the book and indeed in my other book of, of stories there, Little Kingdoms, as well. Um, so it just finished filming about a month ago. So it's a feature length film. It'll come out in about next summer, I'd say. It's got a great cast. Um, Pat Short is in it. Uh, Charlie Murphy, who you know from Love, Hate and things like that. Tommy Tiernan, the comedian, is acting in it and is really fabulous. I saw, um, I saw a rough edit of it last week for the first time and it's completely nuts. Um, <laughs> but there's some really funny bits and some very dark bits. So I think it's very true to the kind of odd atmosphere of the stories. I, I think that my stories, that if people respond to them, it's because the tone is kind of queer in them. You know, the tone shifts an awful lot from kind of light to dark. A story will be moving along in quite a chirpy, breezy, funny way, and then mm. something will kind of suddenly become very difficult or thorny or paranoid. Um, and it's, 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 it's difficult on the page sometimes to do that in any kind of way that's smooth or convincing for the reader. But it's, um, I like to try things that are hard on the page that are difficult to make work out. Mm -hmm. um, it, after a while, and I've been writing fiction for 20 years and full time for for over 10 years now, for 10 or 12 years, it's my, it's my job that I do every day. Um, after a while, you realize that you can, you can write a certain type of story mm -hmm. and you can kind of jump through your hoops a bit. So it's, it's, it's been very interesting to work in different forms over the last few years, as well as the novel, to be working on play scripts and film scripts, because you're kind of opening up your, your kind of toolbox all the time and seeing what you have mm -hmm. in there and what can you do and pushing yourself a little bit. And what's very interesting is the way working in one form can strangely improve you um, mm. in, in another field, you know. Um, a favourite essayist of mine, Gore Vidal, great American essayist, was asked about his style as an essayist, an enviable style as an essayist. And he said he believed it came from a period in the 1960s where he was exclusively writing Broadway dramas for about three or four years. And he said he, he thought it made him as an essayist because he came to see the essay as a kind of a, a dramatic monologue, essentially. And I found that as well. It's really interesting that working on a screenplay or something can really help you as a short story writer. You learn an awful lot about narrative spine and how much you can take away of the initial kind of scaffolding that you put up around the story. And that's the fun of it, actually. Can I take that away? Is it still standing up? And it's how much editing is the fun part. Anyone who writes here themselves all know first drafts are horrible. First drafts are really difficult and they always look like raw sewage on the page. They always look just dreadful, you know. Um, the fun is editing and bringing it up and making it better. Um, I, I, I always think the first draft is like the alien movie where the, where the thing comes out of your man's chest, you know. <laughs> oh, this horrible, gory mess appears and just plonks down on the table. That, that's what a first draft feels like. But I love to, I tend to write long and then cut and cut and cut and cut and cut. Um, so for example, the, the, the most recent novel, Beetlebone, is a slim novel of 50,000 words, I think. But when I was um, cleaning up the shed after I'd finished it after four years and boxing away all the drafts, I did a kind of a rough count. And I guessed that I'd probably written about 400,000 words to get 50. Wow. 
you know, just giving myself a kind of a mound of material and most of it looks like awful shite altogether, mm. but just cutting away. And it's like, to use a kind of a, maybe a slightly cliched analogy, but it's like the sculptor has to give herself the block of stone before she can start chipping away to find the shape that's in there. And it's a very similar process for me. Probably time-wise, very uneconomical way of working, but it's what seems to, to get the stories for me. And a, a couple of people had questions about that in terms of when the stories are finished or at least yeah. f finished in, in, in as much as you can kind of bear to share them with the world. In terms of the collection and the shaping of the collection, uh, again, Chloe Byrne asked, do you pay much heed to the placement of stories in the collection? You know, is it, is it important? And Ali er, Eliart asked similarly, what's the relationship between the short story and the collection? Do you assemble the collection when you've written the stories and you have stories that you leave out. Yeah, it, it, it's short story collections. It, it's a kind of a weird creature, really. You know, a story is written as a story to be read as a single piece or a single entity. So I, I always say to people with collection of stories, don't read it like a novel, like every night. Kind of spread it out a while. Um, spread it out over a few months and go back and dip in and forth for it. Like I see a collection merely as um, just as it's 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 a record of what I've been up to as a story writer for the past five or six or seven years or whatever it is since the previous collection came out. Um, there's great fun in arranging the running order or the sequence. Um, that's, that's when you can kind of have fun with it. And I often think about favourite um, albums and, and records and, uh, and how they, they move and how they flow. So I, I always think like, right, I'll open up with three hit singles kind of a thing <laughs> and then go into quieter, more difficult material in the middle and finish strong with a couple of stories as well. So I, I think a great deal about the sequence, um, even though I don't think readers often don't read a collection of stories in, in sequence as they're laid out. Um, some do. I, I tend to dip in and out of books like that. But yeah, I think about it a lot. Um, and do you get advice on that? I mean, do you get advice from friends, family? Do you get advice from yeah. your publisher? Or is it, a, is it a solo run to make those choices? It kind of is, yeah. I mean, I don't, my, my readers, my first readers, um, my wife Olivia and, and, and my agent Lucy are the first people who see work. But I, 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 there's a lot I don't show them. Like I write lots of stories and like leave very few of them out of the, out of the shed, really. Mm. I probably attempt eight or nine or 10 stories a year. And out of that, only one or two will ever be allowed out of the, of the shed in the back because I'll know even as I'm writing them, oh, this shit, you know, this isn't great. <laughs> but, um, but I finished them all anyway, because I have this kind of almost superstitious belief that it's only by finishing the bad ones you kind of get to earn the good ones when they come along. And it's very, it's a truism, but it's very true that you learn so much by your failures for the ones that don't really end up as being anything good. You learn an awful lot about writing from finishing those. And there's something about a kind of a being true to your craft or something that you need to finish everything that you start on the desk. And I, I, I kind of make a point to doing that because you never know. But I have, I have lots of, I kind of have dozens or hundreds of kind of what I refer to as my zombie stories lying around the shed in various, uh, bad conditions and I sometimes like try and chop a bit off one and stick it onto another and see if that works you know mm. but it's um it's it's a weird mysterious process um writing fiction and especially writing short stories and it's almost the more you do it and the closer in you get to it the less you understand it um it's a, a it's a mysterious art um all you can you know a good one when it comes along you know you're you're, you're fairly certain when you have a good one um, I, I do find that I'm writing fewer stories now than I was when I have an initial idea always my, my temptation was can I make this work within the space of a short story increasingly now I, I am thinking about actors when I get an idea mm -hmm. thinking could I make a little play or something out of this and a lot of that is pragmatic it's just when you're doing a play or something you get out of the house you know you go to rehearsals and you have colleagues <laughs> for a while whereas writing the stories you know it's lonely kind mm -hmm. of work where you're kind of drooling in your little shed in Sligo um, and sort of, I have a little pink rubber ball that I bounce up against the wall for hours on end in what looks probably pretty um, troubling behaviour if you were if you if you were viewing it from afar. So it's it's really nice sometimes to be able to go out and talk to actors and theatre directors and things, and you, you feel like you have a bit of a life. <laughs> you know? uh, 
you're also doing, I think, really generous work for other writers <coughs> um, and indeed visual artists and maybe you know, people in the artistic community in Ireland who are not sufficiently seen and particularly thinking of the work you and Olivia are doing um, you know, with, with winter papers. I always have to hesitate in the title and there's a story there. Um, so I wonder, could you tell us a bit about that? And in relation to that, it relates to a couple of questions we had, which I suppose in a way are state of the nation questions. Um, Pierce McGaughy asks, do you believe in literary golden ages? And if so, do you believe we're currently part of one in Ireland? Um, and friender Mark Machado asks, in recent years, there's been a greater concern with issues of ethnicity, gender, sexuality, and other forms of social inequality in academia and especially among those of us studying language and literature. As a writer, how do you feel about those subjects and do you feel a pressure to engage with those issues? Yeah, I mean, I mean on that latter question, mm. for, first of all, about, about questions of gender and ethnicity and so forth, and I know there is a kind of a, a feeling common to a lot of writers now that you should write very closely to your own experience in terms of gender and ethnicity and so forth, and I completely understand that viewpoint. I don't particularly agree with it. Um, for me, making fiction is an act of creative empathy, and it's an, it's an act of imagination, and I believe that I can write beyond my own direct experience. Um, I can do it well or I can do it badly. That's, that's the, o the only issue there. Um, our golden age mm. in, in, well, it, that will lead in nicely actually mm -hmm. to winter papers. I do find in times of kind of creative, or in, in political flux, um, when the world is apparently gone nuts and horrible things are happening and, in, and at a national level the country's been through such weird um, economic times and political times and strange stuff happening and it's been difficult for so many people in lots of ways. Um, these tend to be very interesting times for artists and writers creatively. Um, the bad times bring up lots of interesting energies for your work and certainly Olivia and I um, we're very conscious that there seem to be a lot of really interesting work happening, not just in writing in Ireland, but in filmmaking, in theatre and in mm. visual arts. And, and we, we had the idea to create, um, it's, it's, it's an anthology that comes out once a year, a beautiful production um, called, it is called Winter Papers. And it was just one of the fundamental things, in it, like it carries stories and essays and everything, but a big part of it is we do these interviews um, and conversations between artists from different forms, like writers talking to filmmakers and so on. And it, I'm really just interested in the nuts and bolts of people asking each other, how do you do it? How do you do your work as a theatre director? Or how do you do your work as a, as a sculptor? You know, What's the morning look like? What are you actually doing moment by moment? And that's mm. really interesting, I think, to, mm. to, to read. Um, but it's also, it's, it's kind of, I, I, I love traditional book making um, and the book as an object. And, and it, was, it was an attempt to make a, a beautiful object. Um, it's a cloth covered, very fancy, lovely thing. We, we had spent some time in Montreal and there's a great bookshop there called Drawn and Quarterly, if anyone ever visits. And they also publish their own stuff, really beautiful editions. And we were struck by the, the, the beauty of what you can do with these kind of craft publishing projects. And, um, and we thought it would, it would be amazing to do something like that in Ireland. And it's, 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 it's gone great, you know. We, like we only do kind of 1,500 copies of it every year, but it, it, it sells out and it's, it's, um, it's a lot of work, but it's, um, Olivia does 92% of it and I have panic attacks on the couch as my part of the, the, the <laughs> production. But it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, a cool, it's a lot of work, but it's a cool thing to oh, be doing. It, yeah. It's a wonderful thing to have um, and, and, and to, to cherish, really. And I was struck in the interview on Arena last night. You made the point at the beginning um, that one of the kind of motivations was that you felt that Irish artists at the moment are interested in that crossover between genres and are kind of impatient uh, at the way in which maybe sometimes genres have been a bit too demarcated. So I wonder if you could tell us a bit about that and, and who, in a way, have been the gatekeepers, you know, who, who have maybe tried to patrol the boundaries yeah, no, I, I found it very interesting that there's a sense that the traditional forms for artistic work, like the novel or the painting or the drama or the feature film, that it's not that these aren't quite um, capacious enough to, 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 to refract or represent our current new, very mad, very crazy looking world, which we're just coming to terms with. It's almost as if there's a feeling that new forms of storytelling and representation are needed for a very new and very different world. Obviously, the fact that we're all online, all of our waking hours, is really changing the way we mm -hmm. perceive narrative and the way we use storytelling and the way we deliver stories. And it's going to change. It's going to change it utterly, I think, or, or over the next coming decades and, and years. Um, 
I think it's very, very visible if you look at something like theatre, where, where there's, there's a huge dissatisfaction with the traditional kind of narrative play, that like mm. Irish play that's in a kitchen mm. with stuff going on, and mm -hmm. people are trying to bring music in and, and, and dance and, and dance and yeah. all sorts of different elements. Mm. If you look at work from someone like Enda Walsh um, or some of the work that Anu do in, do in Dublin, they're trying to bring in new, new ways of telling the stories, really. And it's, it, ha it has struck me this year, we have a, a really interesting conversation between the writer Claire Louise Bennett and a dancer, Mary Noonan, talking about how, how they go about their work and mm. what's similar and what's different. Mm. Um, and it, it's just really interesting to see people kind of peeping over the fences. In, mm. in, I don't know if there are gatekeepers as such, yeah. but it's just, I know myself, I, I find it really... Well, sometimes yeah. economics can be a gatekeeper, of course, can't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And actually a, a big concern that I have still, um, and it's a situation that's getting worse rather than better, is um, an issue where, where, where people from working class backgrounds find it very difficult to mm. pursue a career in the creative arts and they don't really have, have access to it. Um, it's very difficult to go to drama school in London or mm. Dublin because mm. you just can't afford to. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's young writers and artists and emerging writers and artists respond to examples within their own community, you mm. know? Um, like when I was growing up in Limerick in the 80s, um, there was one writer in town. Mm. There was one kind of serious novelist who was publishing abroad, Michael Curtin. Um, and when there's only one around, it seems like mm. an unlikely thing to be doing mm -hmm. with your life or to try and attempt. Yeah. Um, so it's, I don't know what can be done about it. It's, it's, it's a really strange thing for young writers and artists now because always the thing was when you were trying to do that, you'd move to the city. You'd mm. go to Paris or London or mm -hmm. New York or Dublin even. Good luck with that now yeah. if you think you can afford to be a young writer or artist in one of these places. So there is a trend I've noticed about in Ireland certainly where creative people are moving back to country places, you know, mm -hmm. because it's cheaper. Um, to live there and you don't have to work 50 jobs just to pay the rent every mm -hmm. month. So it's, I think there's a really interesting thing. We can see it in South County Sligo you know, over the last few years. So many different new people showing up who are, you know, who are graphic designers, who are musicians, who are writers, just thinking, okay, well, the rent here is literally a fifth or a sixth mm -hmm. of what it is in Dublin. So I don't have to do 15 jobs as a barista just to pay my mm -hmm. rent every month. Mm -hmm. So it's. Um, and where you place yourself physically is very important into the type of work that emerges as well, you know. Mm. Um, we moved to County Sligo because the housing was cheap up there and it's 10 years ago now and it's feeding very much into the type of work mm. that, that, I, that, I, mm. um, that mm. I write myself. I often think about this in terms of someone like John McGahern, say, uh, the great Irish novelist, um, story writer and memoirist, but he, he moved back to his own place, his home place in Leitrim in the 1970s um, he had been living in Dublin and I think it was that move actually back there that gave him his great final work, the great last three or four books and he was unusual in that his last three or four books were his best books um, and if he had stayed in Dublin and had an mm. academic position or mm -hmm. something you would have had a very different mm. novelist. Mm -hmm. So very often it's what seems like a pragmatic decision in your life, where am I going to place myself, mm -hmm. turns out to be the critical creative decision that you make. Well, it, it's our good fo fortune that we can lure Kevin to Dublin <laughs> um, now and again. Just in the last minute or two, this is kind of the time of year, I think, when people are asked on, about their kind of favourite books. And I'm just going to throw this question really at Kevin of kind of two, maybe two books that people should read, one older one and, or, or even an author, one older one and one new voice. Yeah. Um a new voice I'd strongly recommend actually is Claire Louise Bennett, who, who I mentioned um, a few minutes ago. She published her first collection of stories called Pond with Stinging Fly Press, who also brought out my first book a few years ago now. Um, to call them stories doesn't quite do them justice. They're almost like these short prose poems, um, very peculiar, but incredibly intense and, um, and, and, and really beautiful work. Um, in terms of something Something old. Something older that I've read recently for the first time. I am actually the the I, I've been I read in winter. I seem to hunker down a lot with kind of biographies, literary biographies, and the the great I reread the great Beckett biography by James Nolson called Damned to Fame um, recently, and it really is a masterclass in the form of of literary biography. It's you know 
not much actually went on day to day in Beckett's life, but he made a real page turner out <laughs> of biography. And it comes, the, the character of the writer comes across, um, I love his work of course, but it's, he also comes across as a very generous, very, very decent, warm person. Um, and it, it, it was a really beautiful reading experience actually. Well, thanks everybody for the rapt attention. It's been a real treat and a particular thanks to Kevin. Cheers. Thank